in the scripture three times a year they would have feast and some of those lasted for 14 days so it's not bad to take some days off for wonderful time with your family and uh, loving and thanking God and getting to visit and talk and and uh, eat how many eaters do we have in the house now if if you didn't raise your hand we need to come to the altar because you're not telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me God <laughs> I can tell by the way we look that we are doing pretty good we've had something <laughs> I'm, I'm including myself in that yes Amen. It is, it is quite a joy to see the Lord minister in our lives. Here we are in Esther, Esther chapter 6. <clears throat> Esther chapter 6. Well, we, we might just start in Esther chapter 3. And verse, one verse, just for the sake of time. The chicken shack will still be open when you get out, probably. <laughs> One more hour. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Look, look at Esther chapter 3 and verse number 13. And thank you, uh, each one that has a part in running our sound system and putting the scriptures and the songs up. John's kind of taking care of that right now. Thank you much. I love, I love for you to see what the Bible says. And if you'll notice at the bottom, this is the King James Version. I said one time I didn't care what version you read because most people don't read enough anyway to make any difference. <clears throat> but if you're going to read the scripture, it's good to get as close to the original text as you can. And the King James Version is one of those. Some of the other ones, it's sad, have been tampered with. <clears throat> And maybe maybe they're not all bad. I, I don't know, but I would just rather. I grew up on the King James version. I love I love that. So anyway, it's a it's a wonderful thing to get close to it and let the Lord speak into your life. Here we are in Esther chapter three, verse number thirteen. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces. This was before computer, you can tell, and no text mix message to destroy to kill and to cause to perish. How would you like for that letter to come to your house? They sent this to everybody, every state. Now I think in Canada, Cal was here from uh, Canada. Canada, they call y'all states, provinces? Okay, provinces, okay. Yeah, so it was, uh, this might have been like they do in Canada sometimes. <clears throat> to, to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish, all look at this word. How many are we going to kill and who are we going to kill? Every Jew. Friends, this has happened over and over. What's happening in America this morning is not uncommon. The hatred for God's people, the Jewish nation that he brought through Abraham, the actual bloodline of Abraham has been hated for, for years and years. One of the main reasons for the hatred of the Jews is because the word of God came through them. That's in Romans about chapter 3. Everything that we have here came from the Jewish nation because God spoke to them only first. The Ten Commandments came to the Jewish people. And that's how come we have what we know as the Old Testament. The New Testament is because they are the ones that brought it out. It wasn't until the 10th chapter of the book of Acts that the Gentile church was actually brought into the covenant. Seeable with natural eyes. And the Jews that saw that were like, oh, this can't happen. But the Lord opened his arms up great big wide and said, I'm willing to save the whole world. Anybody that will come, I'm willing to save them. That's incredible. Here they are trying to kill them, and this has been thousands of years ago. To kill, cause to perish all Jews, both young and old. So that would even be children, little children, and women. Have you noticed what Hamas has been doing to little children and women and any of the Jews they can get a hold of? And, and they, they picked out a day. In one day, 
even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So this is one time, if you could find out anybody that was close to you that was your neighbor, that had stuff you wanted, on this particular day, you had the opportunity to go kill them and get what they wanted. And the king had his name through a, a secondary leader named, uh, anybody remember his name? Haman. His name was Haman. <clears throat> He's the one that had drawn this up. Uh, Hazarias really doesn't know the extent of all of this. He just gave him a free hand and this is where he went with it. <clears throat> What happens in verse number, or in chapter 6 and verse number 1 through 12, the Lord raises up a mediator before this comes to pass. So I want to read just a little here out of Esther chapter 6 and verse number 1. On that night could not the king sleep. How many knows the Lord can control the, I mean, can control the kings and the presidents? Democratic or Republican, the last say is in the hands of God. Nobody can outdo God. That's incredible. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the books of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but that seems like a kind of drudgery way to spend the night just reading through. But you know, God has a way of getting his deal done. And so they're reading down through all the chronicles that's been happening for the last years and months. And, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thena and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king of Hazarias. And the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now, this is the guy that wrote the letter that says we're going to kill every Jew. I don't know if Ahasuerus, I don't think that it had been told him yet that Mordecai was a Jewish man, which it didn't, it didn't matter. At this time, he just looking over the Chronicles, but how many knows God's, God's got your back? Woo! And the king said, who's down there in the court? Now Haman was, in, was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court, and the king said, Let him come in. He said, I've been up all night anyway. I need to get this taken care of. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought a lot of himself. <laughs> It sounds kind of like uh, what our lesson was about that uh, we have something in us that says, this is the Sunday school lesson. The head gets big too quick. He thought a lot of himself. So uh, now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? Have you ever said myself? Okay, well, let that one go then. <laughs> Look at verse number seven. So, hey, no, this is six. I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'm right. You're right. Number seven. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king uses to wear. And the horse that the king rideth upon and the crown royal which is set up on his head and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him 
Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to yourself. That's not what it says, is it? Who are you going to do this to? Would you say that word with me? Mordecai. Can you imagine what happened in Haman's heart when that word went through his ears and traveled up to his brain? And the realization of, Do even so to Mordecai, and notice this word, the Jew. That said it at the king's gate, let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Friends, I'm just going to tell you, Israel's going to win in the end, so don't. They, nobody can beat God. Then took Haman the apparel of the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him. Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And he's walking, leading the horse that Mordecai is riding. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hastened to his house. Can you read that word? Morning. Morning. And don't see me. He's got his head all covered up. What's wrong? Whoa. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask you this morning that somewhere out of this passage, Lord, we could look at how important Thanksgiving really is. And how you use this book of Esther to show us what should be done. We thank you for it now in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. In verse number three, something is spoken here that we need to look at as we're looking at Thanksgiving. And the king said, what honor and dignity has been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. So what's really Thanksgiving about? It's not just turkey and dressing, and I love turkey and dressing. It's not just pumpkin pie with a little bit of on the top. It's not just about the pilgrim's or the Indians, really thanksgiving is what belongs to God Almighty. And what's broken out here is you look at what they've been talking about in Sunday school, that all of the Old Testament speaks into the new, and it's a schoolmaster, according to Galatians chapter 3, that shows us some of the attributes and traits that we should have and that Christ has towards us. And so here in this book, this whole book is really centered around this Jewish need uh, for Mordecai from, from the beginning to the end. It just shows what God does whenever the Jews are taken and put up as a, as a dartboard and how he's going to run interference. And also out of this comes the recognition, and this is my first point in verse number two, recognizing that you, you need somebody. The king, who does the king need really? Whenever he looks around, it's like, I'm the king, you know. But what he needed to know is who would like to kill me? Who would like to take me down? And he, he got to, as they were reading down through these chronicles, he said, you know what? If that guy hadn't have interceded for me and told me what was going on, I would be a dead man today. And I've got to know something. I want to know one thing. What has been done for the man that saved my life? And they said, nothing. And so when you, when you recognize, even the king at this point realizes, I wouldn't be here if somebody hadn't have helped me. And friends, we need to recognize today that there is no hope for us unless we go to Christ. Doesn't matter how much money you got in your pack, pocket, how long you've lived, whether you're a man or woman or where you don't even know. Amen. There's still one Savior and his name is Jesus. And we should be lifting our hands and recognize we need somebody. And the one we need is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So as I'm talking to you about this uh, Thanksgiving message, God used Thanksgiving here to save a, na a nation. So when this king realizes that he needed somebody, he says, I want to do something about this. 
in verse number two, it was found written, Mordecai I had told of the two king's chamberlains, it gives their names, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. When he finds that out, he says, I, if somebody help me, I'm, I'm going to take care of that. So one of the first lessons that we need to know is <clears throat> we, need to, we need to know that we never get so high and mighty that we don't need to be thankful and have gratitude. Yes. It's not uncommon for Americans, especially today, they say that this is a, a, a whole nation that's, that's taken on the thought that the world owes me something. Yeah, it's called entitlement. And so living with that, it's not, a, it's not hard for us just to walk out after somebody's helped us and just say, not say nothing like, I deserve that. How much does it cost just to say thank you or to show gratitude? My dad, I, I, I love to tell stories about him because he was always such a wonderful Christian. But he was cutting feet up at <clears throat> Fluvanna. And there was about three gates you had to go to, through to get down to where he was. And uh, his machine had broke down and he was working on it. And the owner uh, had, could see down the road that he had, he had quit cutting and his feed was tall and he was wanting his feed cut. And so he gets uh, about a half a case of beer right out of the cooler and brings it over there to my dad. He goes through all those gates, comes down there and says, he didn't know my dad didn't drink, but he comes down there and he says, Barry said, man, I, it's hot. I mean, it just sweat was pouring everywhere. He said, I just wanted to bring you something to cool you off. I brought you about a half a case of beer. And my dad, my dad called his name and said, man, I just want to say thank you from the start. Thank you so much for even thinking about me, for even caring about me. Said, uh, I used to drink a lot, but said, uh, whenever I got saved, I had never drank no more since then. <clears throat> but I left that world. <clears throat> that boy loaded his beer back up, put it back in the cooler. He takes off, goes through those three gates, plumb back out to the road, goes all the way home, comes back, goes through those three gates, and he's got water now. <laughs> Isn't that precious? He says, well, he didn't want this, but I'm going to get him some water. <laughs> wow, that's precious. And friends, when you're, when you're thankful, they're just some, you just want to do something. And to recognize that you need somebody is a real important thing because no man is an island. We need help. Nobody can get to heaven without Jesus. And we need to look our life over and say, Lord, I need you. And I want to be thankful from the get-go to recognize that I need somebody in my life. <clears throat> to all worldly Hebrews, we're just merchandise. The people, even if it's Roy Rogers, he probably never knew you. I love when you're shouting now. He looks good on the screen. He loved everybody he's around pretty much. He had to kill a bunch of some bad guys, but does he know you? No. Nah. And he seems approachable. Even the best heroes, friends, you're just merchandise to them. That, and that's reasonable. They can't do, they can't see everybody. They don't know all your needs, your ups and downs. Even if you've got their uh, big old poster strapped to your wall, man or woman, they have no way to really get to you and fix the problem that you and I have. Nobody can do that. There's just one hero out there that can touch everybody and wants to touch everybody and died in everybody's place. We must know that we need somebody. We need a hero. And we don't need a human one so bad as we do. We need somebody. His name is Jesus. He goes all the way to Calvary for us. And we want to recognize that need that we need somebody. Here the writer in Isaiah 59 and 16 and by the way, in the Sunday school class, they was tromping on my message. <laughs> yeah, that's precious, isn't it? But I love the scripture. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. My dad, as great as he was to me in, in our home, I was, I was raised uh, probably different than a lot of people, but I never heard my dad or mom uh, getting a fuss. Now, they may have went out behind the barn and had a knockdown drag out, but I've never seen it in the house. <laughs> never heard an unkind word toward my mom or her toward my dad. And uh, all, all of my life, 
and, and I, I, that's the way I just grew up. But still, my dad, there was times that, that he wasn't there. He couldn't, he couldn't be everywhere. He couldn't do everything. I needed somebody that could go past that, and his name is Jesus Christ. Here he says, I saw that there was no man, wonder that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Uh, the, the lesson today boiled it all down from Adam all the way to Jesus trying to get us a good picture that there was just one intercessor that can really get the job done and his name is Christ. So we got to recognize that we need somebody to come and help us. <clears throat> the writer says on down in verse number 19 of this same chapter, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the who? Who? Roy Rogers may not can get there, but guess who can? The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. This, this has been several years ago, but this is one of my moments of needing some help real bad. We had had a call and a, a guy had three cows and three yearlings that had got, he'd, he'd gathered everything off of this place except these. And he called and said, uh, I've had a, a helicopter man, two different groups of people come and said, there's so much brush in this pasture that we haven't been able to get these cattle off. They're wanting to bring new cattle in and uh, they don't want these wild ones in their bunch. <clears throat> and he said, I'll tell you what, this guy told me, this was the last thing he said uh, about the situation. He said, I'm tired of paying people and getting nothing done. And so I told him, I said, well, we, we have gathered uh, right smart of cattle that was uh, kind of obnoxious. But I said, here's what we'll do. If we don't catch anything, you don't have to pay nothing. And I heard a little laugh on the other end of the line. But I said, what we catch, we get paid for. And I told him what would what be on the cows and what would be on the yearlings. And he said, come on. And so when we got there, we prayed. Yeah, come on now. You think that's crazy? And uh, the two of the men was there at the pickup, and I said, "Well, I'm I'm just going to go look around just a little bit. It's just now breaking day. We got there; it was dark, just breaking day. And you're not going to believe this, but I rode over a hill, and they weren't those cattle weren't in the thickest part of the pasture. They was almost out in the open. I rode up on them, and they was bedded down. And I had my phone. When I, when I opened my phone up, it went like that, and the cattle jumped up and took off running. <laughs> and I was hollering at them, boys. <laughs> what are you going to do? Six, six running every way in the world, three of us. <laughs> anyway, we, we caught some of them. And uh, so I changed horses, got me another pony, man, we was, we was searching for some more. And in, in that deal, uh, I had roped a, a cow that was real crazy, and I was on a bronc, and she just went out on the end of the line and sat down like that, and he, this horse was holding her, but every once in a while he'd throw a fit because he had never had a cow, you know, hold, have to hold her that long. And I mean, this is like 20 minutes into the deal, and Randy called me on my phone. So I've got my dally, and i got my reins there, and I got that phone out. It's one of them flip phones, you know, that flipped open. And uh, I got him on the phone. He said, hey, I found this other cow. What do you want me to do? Leave her <laughs> and come help me. <laughs> when you get the head, you want somebody to get the back legs. And I mean, she is eating my lunch and that horse was eating my lunch. I just couldn't stand to turn her loose. And so he said, well, where are you at? I said, head toward the cattle guard where we come in, wherever you are. I said, I'm just, I'm probably three or 400 yards from that. And you'll hear me screaming when you come by. <laughs> so man, he come, caught the back legs. We got her down tighter. And it's like, Ah! That's just, I'm, how many has ever had a time that you needed somebody? Like when your tar was flat or your car wouldn't crank or your battery was dead or your husband had got angry at you or you had got mad at your husband. I mean, I'm not even looking for a little bit. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> Do we need help? Yes, we need help so bad. That was a desperate time for a few moments when it was over. Now, where's the other cow? Aren't we crazy? Yeah, I know y'all wouldn't do nothing like that, but yeah. Now, in 
Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12, this boils it down to our lostness and where we are without Christ. You may think you can do this by yourself. In the Sunday school lesson, that dominion, the dominion that man has over things, it trips us up sometimes. And we get to thinking, I can even handle my sin. Friend, you can't handle sin. I can't handle sin. Sin can only be dealt with through the shed blood of Jesus. 55 churches here in Snyder, you could join every one of them and still split hell wide open. You can shake all the preacher's hands. They can't save you. You can go to the Pope. He can't save you. He may think he can, but he can't. If you get saved, you're going to have to be under the blood of Jesus Christ. And the writer here in this parable or this passage of scripture gives us the true meaning of where we are without Christ. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. And notice these words, having no hope. If you're in this building today and you haven't recognized Christ as your Savior and don't recognize him that he's the only way. There is no hope for you except in Christ. No hope for me except in Christ. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. A greater part of our society today lives without God. They have food, they work, they have money, they work, they have cars, they got gas, they got oil in their automobile. Come on now. But they don't need God yet. But friends, I want to tell you, every one of us have no hope of tomorrow. Look at our lives. Just drive by the graveyard. You'll see people that died when they was infants, people that's three years old, 10 years old, 5, 25, 30. I mean, I lost my own brother when he was 23. The boy just younger than me. He's gone. <clears throat> Yeah, one car accident. Wow. You don't have to be a way up in years to, to, to go home. I mean, any of us could die on the way home or have a brain injury. I mean, look at the stuff that happens. So because of that, I beg you to listen to this first point. We need somebody, and the somebody we need is Jesus. If you're not following him, please today make your mind up. I'm in a crisis of life and didn't even recognize it. I'm running around without my sins being forgiven. Let me come to Christ. I need Christ. The second thought out of this passage is in verse number two also. <clears throat> the king was proud that somebody cared for him because here in this passage, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keeper of the doors, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. So even though he knew these guys, he also loved the king enough. He's a, he's a Jew from a foreign country. He's there in Shushan, close to the palace, and he recognizes they're fixing to do something to the king and I care enough to get in trouble, whatever it takes. And did you know that him caring for the king is what was bringing all this trouble on the Jewish people? When they found out that Mordecai was a Jew, Haman, he set a vendetta against him. We read it in the third chapter, the 13th verse, where he said, I'm going to get every one of them. We're going to kill them, destroy them, put to death every Jew on the face of the earth. Anywhere we can find one, we're going to kill him. Yeah. And so know that somebody cares. That's important. And the somebody that cares for us, his name is Jesus. He really cares. Your pastor may not care as much as he needs to. I figured there'd be an amen right there. <laughs> I'm really just a human. You figured that out pretty quick. But there is somebody that really cares, that knows, that can do something about the problem. Isn't that wonderful? Through text now, we see so many troubles. It's good. We can pray over them. But you know who's going to take care of that trouble? It's going to take God to run interference for us. Yes, and let him meet that need. Mordecai had told. He loved his king enough. He was trying to take care of that. In John three sixteen, it says, For God so loved the world. You can quote the rest of the scripture, but he really wants people to be saved and he's willing to put something out to get that done. He died in our place and God was willing to give him in that manner. 
in John chapter 10 and verse number 18, you can see here that Jesus Christ actually had an option. He did not have to die for us. He could have let the whole world go to hell. But instead, look what he says here. No man taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. As wicked as the Jewish people were and the church of that day, the scribes and Pharisees and the men that beat and bruised and hung Jesus on the cross of Calvary, they couldn't have done it without his permission. He laid his life down for of himself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Knowing that, friends, it freed my heart. Boy, when I get to the last of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where they're killing Jesus, it, when we read through the Bible, that just that, that breaks my heart. But this scripture, knowing that Jesus did it because he wanted to do it for us, that's the precious thing that brings salvation. No man taketh it from me, I let down on myself. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 42, we see him battling this out. He went away again the second time and prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. Notice these words, thy will be done. Mordecai jeopardized his life, the queen's life, and all of Israel and the Jewish nation, their lives, to save King Ahasuerus because he cared about his life. And that, that is why the thanksgiving comes out of the king. It came for that reason. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6 and verse number 8, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth his love where? Toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't you know Mordecai is praying and thinking, Lord, I helped save the king. And now we're just weeks away from every Jew on the face of the earth being annihilated. And I helped the king and, and nobody's, nobody said nothing. But God said, you know what? I'm going to get that king up and let him go to reading down through there. He's going to. And just minutes before Haman comes in, he's reading about Mordecai the Jew. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? That's the power of the Lord to reach out toward us. There's an old song that says, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. No, sir. And friends, it's still that way this morning. No one cares like him. He's reaching out to us today to make a difference in our life. The third thing I'd like to talk to you about in closing is verse number three. This is back to the king. And the thought that comes from this is that he recognized something has to be done. In this passage of scripture, and the king said, what honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, well, we've, we've bought him a new pickup. He's got a cell phone. He's got a new house. Uh -uh. What does it say? There is nothing done for him. In light of that, what have we done for Christ? Where is our praise? Where is our thanksgiving? Where is our for repentance? Have we done anything for Jesus or do we need to? Somebody that really died for us in our place, spilled his blood, shouldn't there be some thanksgiving rising up from the bottom of our heart instead of saying, Lord, we know what you did, but we don't care. When we won't say thank you, it's we don't care. When we won't praise, there's a reason for it. But even the king recognizes and asks the question, something, he says, what has been done? They said, nothing. He said, something has to be done. And so what about our response today? Shouldn't something be done from us? And Lord, we got to say, we've got to say thank you somehow. Let us say thank you. What honor and dignity hath been done? And they said nothing. 
in verse number six. So Haman came in and the king said unto him, what shall be done unto the man that the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself. You know who we like to praise? Are we caught in the lights? Absolutely. The normal nature of humanity is, I did it. Our pastor years ago, his name was Norman Oden, told a story about a frog that, you know, he, he must have lived in West Texas because his pond dried up. <laughs> And two geese saw him there, knowing that there was water over the mountain. <clears throat> they flew in there and stopped, and they was talking to him. And they said, hey, man, he said, what happened? He said, well, I'm just hopping around here. He said, there's no, no water for me. And they said, you know what? There's water over the hill, just over the mountain there. There's a big lake. And he said, yeah, but I could never get that far. And they, they picked up a stick between them, these two geese did. And they said, well, we're going to squat down real good. And you come up here and just jump up and grab this stick in your mouth. And we'll just airlift you over the mountain. And so, man, the frog instantly, boy, he makes his jump and catches. And he's hanging on to that stick. And them geese, they just real gently start raising up. And they pick the frog up off the deal. And they, they're flying. And... You know, going over the mountain, they got real close to the ground because the height. And so it, there's a, some hunters there, and they're watching these geese. You know, this ain't no little bitty frog. This is a big one. I got frog legs. You ever heard? Okay. <laughs> Here, he's hanging on like crazy, and they fly, they fly right over these hunters. And these hunters said, I just wonder. Who in the world ever thought of that? And all of a sudden comes this frog voice that says, Ah! <laughs> I did. Poop. Are we caught? What do we need to say? Yeah, we need to recognize that something has to be done about our lack of thankfulness. And Lord, let us break loose and every day we live from this day forward, somehow could we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God the Father. As I, I was praying this morning uh, in our early prayer meeting at eight, I was thinking about the Our Father prayer and what just zoomed me right at the front is that he actually wants us to call him our father. That's pretty awesome, as wicked as I've been. Now, y'all may have been a little cleaner than that, but when I thought about me saying our father which art in heaven, and he wants, not everybody had a good daddy like mine, but guess who's standing up there saying, I'd like to, I'd like to be your father. It's God Almighty that was willing to pour out his heart through his son to father this world. Our father, which art in heaven. Woo. You talk about, we should be thankful. We need to recognize that something has to be done about this. So here comes Haman. He's got the royal apparel. He's got the horse and he's got the crown. Can you imagine his eyes when he sees the Jew Mordecai? Woo. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18. <clears throat> In everything give thanks for this is, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Wow. That never came so true to me as when back to my dad, he was run over by a tractor. A stripper tractor it had a basket on the top of it. So, you know, the stripper alone's heavy. The tractor's heavy. It was a 4020 John Deere. And it run, run over him, uh, run over, crushed his hips, 
pulled his arm out of socket and stuffed it down in between his ribs. Went right by his face, just skint the hide off the right side of his face. Made a 180 degree, they went and measured it, 180 yard circle. He couldn't move and came right back over him and straddled him and run over him the second time. He had enough presence of mind to reach up with his left arm that was still working and catch that tractor by the front uh, axle and drug right there until my cousin jumped off of his tractor and the second attempt he caught that tractor and stopped it and my dad thought he had run over him because Ricky Dale had been there he thought that Ricky had run over him anyway they come and got me there was five of us pulling cotton there he come and one of the boys come and got me and run down there and said your dad's been run over you can imagine when I stepped off that tractor and they told me that man I mean my mind is like (sighs) so I'm praying all the way down there and God please save daddy somehow I got there they got him rolled over he's on his back he's got his coveralls on that was before cow tractors (laughs) and your cow was your coveralls (laughs) Insulated, double insulated coveralls. It's cold, cold. He's laying there on his back, man. I jumped out of that pickup and run down there and I, I got right over him about that far from his face. His eyes was closed. I, I just looked at him and uh, all of a sudden his eyes opened up and when he saw me, he said, praise the Lord. Like that scared me to death. And, I'm, I'm not, and I said, because I'm thinking, daddy, you're dying. And I, this, is, this was my response and I know I'm, I'm showing you how dumb I was, but... I said, what for? I was crying. I said, and he said, he got that tractor off of me. (laughs) You talk about, man, it broke my heart that he had that much in him to give thanks. Man. Friends, I want you to know that Jesus deserves. He deserves our thanksgiving. The doctor said he wouldn't live, but he, I mean, there wasn't nobody come to his room that didn't get a blessing out of the Bible. <laughs> he loved on them, prayed for them. <laughs> the three weeks he was there, <sighs> hundreds of people, the three months he was down the bed, hundreds of people, every day there was just a line of cars of people come to see my daddy out there. They loved it. Bear Williams, come to see him. <clears throat> And all of them, he talked to them and thanked God that he was alive. And he said, I'm going to get out of this bed one of these days. And he made it, made it back to farming. How come? Nothing but the power of God to reach out and touch. One of the doctors told me, I said, you know what? They've done an autopsy on that old tractor. The tractor belonged to me. So they've done an autopsy on that old tractor. They got three farmers out of it. They said, your, da- your, daddy, your daddy, pretty tough. Isn't it time to say, Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I honor you. I glorify you. You see, if you go to hell, nobody will get you out. So friends, it's time to make things right on this side. Get right, stay right, and then when trouble comes, the awful is trouble. Where is the, thank you, Lord. For what? Thank you that you saved me. Thank you that you forgave me. Thank you that you love me. Woo! We have such grand hope in Christ. So he says here in this passage, in everything give thanks. Why? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you one more thought in revelations chapter 19 and verse number 11 thinking about the schoolmaster and how the old testament is a teacher and just a foreshadow of some of the things that that's going to happen this hasn't happened yet when jesus actually came to jerusalem and rode an animal do you remember what he rode He rode a burrow. You've never seen nobody go to war on a burrow. They would be the laughing stock of the world. On a horse? Yes, sir. Lots of battles fought there. But Jesus comes on a burrow. But Mordecai is not riding a burrow. He's not riding just anybody's horse. Mordecai is riding the greatest horse on the face of the earth because you know what the king that rules the whole world gets he gets the best 
And that's what Mordecai is riding. He's riding Ahasuerus' horse. He's being led by Haman. And when you look at this passage of Scripture in Revelation 19 and 11, here's our Lord and Savior, and he's not on the burrow this time. <clears throat> he's coming back to fight for Israel and Jerusalem, and this is actually going to happen. This hasn't happened yet. This is prophetic. We're not too far away from it. Of course, I don't know, and nobody else does, really. It'll happen in God's timing. But just to know it's out there and to know that that could be a part of the symbolism of Christ. Number one, he was of Jewish descent when he was here on the earth. And here he's not just riding any horse. He's riding the one his dad picked up for him. Yeah. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Woo! And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So here's Haman leading that horse out. And here's our Jesus in Revelations 19. He's horseback and he's coming back to fight the battle of Armageddon. And we get to go with him. That's going to be a wonderful thing, isn't it? Somebody was aggravating me about loving horses. And I said, well, you better get ready to ride. Because if you come back with Jesus, you're going to be horseback. They said, yeah. <laughs> Could we stand together this evening? Thankfulness should be part of our daily life. There should be something in our mind that says something has to be done about this thought of thanking God and Christ for being our Savior. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you can be thankful that there is a way to Christ. And that way is through the blood that he shed on Calvary. No man cometh to the Father except through the Son, and no man cometh to the Son except through the Father. Your salvation is a joint action of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And if you know in your heart that you're not right with God, I'd like to give that first opportunity by an uplifted hand. We'd love to pray for you this morning. And believe God with you that you could find this Jesus that's searching for your soul today. Anybody by an uplifted hand. Pastor, I know that I'm not right with God. And I want to make things right this morning and ask God to forgive me of my sins. I'd like to live for Jesus. What days I've got left, I would like to do something about my thankfulness in Christ. Anyone? Okay, how many would join with me this morning and say, Pastor, I know that there's times that I have not been thankful, but I'd like to fix that today. Here's hands going up all over this building. I'd like to be more thankful and I'd like to honor, I'd like to do something about my unthankfulness. These altars are open. Would you come today and let the Lord speak into your heart on this Thanksgiving Sunday?